Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Tonic Accord podcast. I'm Alex, joined by my friend Drew. Drew, how's your day going? It's going good. Staying inside, washing my hands. Haven't been outside in like three and a half days. Doing the thing. How's the cabin fever treating you? Oh, man. I'm boy, am I glad that we have the internet. If I, I, poof, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm losing it over here. But I'm, I'm staying, staying relatively sane by just trying to find different stuff to watch. I've been watching a lot of Survivor Man, the guy who spent, spends a week out in the woods on his own with filming his own self. So that's been <laughs> tiding me over. Not bad. Okay, that sounds good. At least makes you feel like you're in nature, or at least live through them vicariously, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, good work. I I watched a movie, The Lighthouse, a few nights ago. It's about two guys that just basically lose their minds on an island. It's yeah. about seclusion, and I'm like, you know what? I start to connect with those characters more and more. William Defoe, man. Oof. Hopefully that's not me in like two more weeks, but we'll see. I know. We're, our, our, our next <laughs> podcast is going to be me. Like, you don't like my lobster? <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you eat your beans? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but anyways, um, I wanted to touch on an issue today that is not coronavirus related. Not at all coronavirus related. Um, it's involving Myanmar, which is formerly Burma. And it's a country with a very difficult, testy, and violent history. And so, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that. So, in a nutshell, Myanmar's army has a large amount of political authority. In the lower house of their parliament alone, of the 440 seats in the body, 330 are directly elected citizens, but over 100 of them are military appointees who are nominated by the commander and chief of the defense services, which is pretty crazy when you think about a country that coins itself as a democracy. And on March 11th, this is kind of the relevant issue that relates to the conversation, Myanmar's ruling party, the N. LD, which is the National League for Democracy, tried to reduce the army's role in government by trimming their number of seats. Um, this gained support by the majority, but it did not get a three-fourths uh, threshold due to opposition from the actual military members, who obviously don't want their seats cut. And so the soldiers rejected every proposal, including uh, a bid to basically change the country's name from a disciplined democracy to just a democracy. And this highlights the phenomenon that is occurring in Myanmar, which is, in my opinion, impeding their process of growing into a functioning democracy. And this is that the military has too much independence and power. Um, Miss Su Ki, I'm, I hope I'm not butchering that name too badly, is the state counselor. And she is basically like the president of Myanmar, but she's not coined to that because she only controls the civilian side. The military is independent from her control. And it seems likely to me that this is why her government has been complacent in violence, displacement, and the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya people. It's basically because she cannot control the military. Basically, you have a civilian leader who has embraced democratic reform, but she is working inside of a system that still allows the military junta to maintain power. And so this brings to questions whether the army should be under civilian control and whether there should be somewhat of a separation between the military and politics. And it's a complicated issue because it almost seems like their leader, Miss Su Ki, is is too hopeful about turning the country into a democracy at a time when this military junta can do whatever they want. So, what do you think, Drew? It's a depressing issue. Well, I think I think first off is you know we quickly identified the institutional limitations of this so-called democracy. Right, this is a place Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. Um, was under decades of just military control, right? You know, a, a complete junta control. Um, and so it's only recently in the last, what, five years that it's even been even recognized as somewhat of, of a democracy um, with the NLD winning enough seats. Um, and and uh, I think it's Aung San Suu Kyi. Su Kyi is her name. I, okay. I, again, I, okay. we're, we're, both, we're both probably wrong. Um, but... It's only been re- relatively recently that she was able to have some sort of power. And then again, like you said, the fact that it's written into the Constitution that the military reserves 25% of the seats. And then also, in order to amend that Constitution, you need to get more than 75% of the seats to vote. Then it's like, okay, well, there, there you go. As long as the military remains a single v- voting unit block, which... Guess what? Militaries are pretty good at doing that when you have everyone falling in line and following orders. Um, it's going to be impossible to pass any amendments. And that's exactly what's happening. So, yeah, it's a democracy. And, yeah, 
um, the the leading party, the NLD, has the majority of seats, but they can't make any constitutional change as long as that military has those 25% power. And, and, you know, it's kind of like the chicken or the egg. How do you amend the Constitution to have different seats if it requires the seats to amend the Constitution? So, again, I think there's just blatantly an institutional problem with the way that this government is set up that it essentially still keeps the military in power and because again it's it's been decades and decades of this junta control there's also a cultural issue the military is sometimes referred to as the tatmada and the tatmada sees itself this is uh based off of um someone from griffith university in australia uh, talking about the tatmada he says uh, Andrew Self. He says, the Tatmadaw sees itself as the guardian of the nation and has never distinguished between its military and political roles. That's a very different military culture than we have in the United States. In the United States, it's actually, you know, the military is supposed to be apolitical. The, you know, the they they go by the commander in chief, whatever, or Democrat or Republican. You know, they give him the best information, and they and, and ultimately let him make the decision, and they enact out the decision. The politics is supposed to not be involved in the military's role, whereas in here in Myanmar, it is completely linked together in the culture of that military. And I think that's going to create a problem where it's going to be very hard to root out the military out of their political um, operations. Right. No, that's that's a very fair point, and it does bring up a lot of questions. And I, I think the basic issue is because you're right. There is a culture around this, and it's been a culture for a long time. And I think the elephant in the room is that this country, much like other ones in the region, like Bangladesh and India, have extreme ethnic divisions and extreme religious divisions. I mean, Myanmar is a predominantly Buddhist country. And I think that there is a lot of shared identity in the military basically kind of protecting this image of a Buddhist state. And so when you have other ethnic minorities, I think it just creates kind of this pluralistic chaos. And I think that's why you've seen a culture of control somewhat. And I think actually disciplined democracy, which is, I guess, what they are currently considered, kind of makes sense because that it. I think that is a good word to describe kind of the status of Myanmar right now. Yes, Um you know, the NLD has come up and finally is the majority party, but there's still a military culture that is kind of the backbone. And so I, I want to get into the only reason why the world is really talking about Myanmar, uh, because obviously if it was just for these constitutional issues and this strong military, I don't think anyone would care. But there's the Rohingya issue, which I think is the reason why everything's in the limelight. And so just a really brief background. This is from the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, the Rohingya are an ethnic Muslim minority who are uh, who are part of the Sunni Islam faith. And there are an estimated 3.5 million of them around the world, but most of them live inside of Myanmar, and they reside in the Rakhine state. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but they account for nearly a third of the population. And so the government has, for a long time, since the 60s and 70s, refused to grant them citizenship. For a while, they could walk around with identity cards, but... Things have gotten more drastic where they have never really been considered part of the, the Burmese population. So they've always kind of been an outsider inside of their own country, which we have seen in a lot of places, like we talked about in China with the Uyghurs. I think it's a very similar situation you have going on. And so the Myanmar government has effectively discriminated against this group. Um, and it's a problem even more because the Rakhine state is the least developed and the poorest in Myanmar with a poverty rate of 78%. So basically, this is intensified clashes between the Buddhists and the Muslims. And in 2017 is when this all got into the news, because there was a militant um, Muslim group called the ARSA, which is the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army. And they claimed responsibility for tax on police and army posts. And the government responded by just putting blunt force against the whole population for the acts of a few. And very briefly, within the first month, at least six to 7,000 Rohingyas died. And that's according to Doctors Without Borders. And since then, basically, the United Nation has called what is happening ethnic cleansing, as many of these Rohingyas have been forced to flee to Bangladesh. And the controversy comes out of this is because, you know, um, Myanmar's de facto leader, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, and has claimed to be the first democratically elected, you know, government leader in a generation, has pretty much not condemned these attacks and is, has stepped back. And there's a lot of criticism on her for maybe having more political interests at heart, 
But also there's the criticism of back to this military power where even if she wanted to, she couldn't do anything. But that is why the world's talking about this issue is because of the Rohingya issue. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it is one of those weird things where you have someone that has a Nobel Peace Prize a couple of years ago, and now they're considered, you know, a promoter or at least a an allower of a genocide. And then again, you know, you said the UN marked it, UN classified it as ethnic cleansing. Uh, um, back when she was still there, the Prime Minister of uh, the UK, um, Theresa. Theresa May, yeah. Theresa May, um, she she said it was ethnic cleansing when he was in when he was still in his office. Uh, uh, Rex Tillerson called it ethnic cleansing. Emmanuel Macron has called it a genocide. So you know, again, this is a pretty widely recognized as a genocide um, or an ethnic cleansing. I mean, you know, an atrocity. Um, and just to kind of give an idea uh, of some of the numbers that we have. Um, you know, we're talking about over a million people being displaced out of the Rakhine state. Um, you know, this is the this is the largest human exodus in Asia since the Vietnam War. You know, this is a huge, <laughs> huge refugee crisis. And on top of that, I mean, the actual numbers of who have been killed. Have, you know, we're talking about um, eighteen thousand um, re- reports of gang rapes and sexual violence. One hundred sixteen thousand reports of beatings. 36,000 reports of people being thrown into fires. I mean, we're talking about insane amounts of violence in the last few years, like hard to hard to swallow amounts of violence. Um, And this is all underneath the government of someone who has a Nobel Peace Prize who used to walk around and hang out with Obama and, you know, be touted as this, wow, this great, you know, democratic leader in a in a fledgling nation. Um, it was interesting because of this whole like change in tone of how the world has approached um, Suchi. I I watched an old CNN uh, like little biopic, like a five minute bio thing on her from 2015, and it was amazing how positive it was at the time. Of like, you know, she's beloved by her people. Her she was a political prisoner by the junta. Her father was killed for speaking up, you know, and she's a, a a symbol of what, you know, good Buddhists could be. And now how just quickly the tone has changed to she's a purveyor of genocide. Um, and I believe me, the YouTube comments were not as were not nearly as friendly to her either um, for what that's worth. But it was just interesting to see how, you know, how Western media portrayed her a few years ago versus how they portray her now. Right. Right. And I, you know, I, I think she's a complicated figure as we are seeing from this, you know, and there's that good Atlantic article that I think, I think both of us checked out by yeah, Ben definitely. Rhodes, who is a deputy uh, national security advisor to Obama. Mm. And I, I think he had a really nice, just kind of overall analysis of her. I mean, this is a lady who, who had been part of the NLD in the nineties and had gone through detention, house arrest, attacks on her life. You know, she'd lost family members and she went through it and she prevailed and did become the first leader of a democratically elected party in the country. So, you know, I think I think I think a lot of people over the last couple of years have kind of downplayed her successes. And I think in some ways she's historic for at least bringing to the table the idea of trying to get democratic reform. And I think that's important to talk about. Um, but some of the criticisms of her come because basically she's gotten used to the prizes and the recognition for what she's done. And now that she's being criticized, she basically thinks that she's right and her critics are wrong. And so it's basically kind of created this this quagmire where she hasn't done anything because maybe she can't. But also she hasn't done enough because I think the nation isn't completely ready for democracy like we've talked about. Um, it, it According to that Atlantic article, I think Ben Rhodes thinks that she thinks that by getting the democratic process, eventually the rights of the individual will come. But unfortunately, it almost seems like she's missed a step. Like she's she's too hopeful that Burma or sorry, Myanmar is automatically a democracy. But it sounds like they've missed a few steps. And before they reform their constitution, I think it'll be hard for her to do what she wants to do. And, you know, there was an interview with who Sherry Zhao. I'm butchering it. So don't don't criticize me. Who's a human rights activist and an ethnic chin, which is a persecuted Christian minority in Myanmar. And he basically complained about the West not probing her record enough. He said, in quotes, your government never asked tough questions. The EU did not either. The UN did not. 
We ethnic people did not. Nobody. And she and so she believes that Shu Shu Qin's main preoccupation was her ascent, and it was cloaked in the language of human rights. Right. And I and I think that could be a little bit drastic because her record actually I think does show that she believes in human rights, but but like I said I think the world has changed around her and they've missed a step. They're almost a broken system that's trying to masquerade as a democracy. Well, I also think I, I, I also think there's a little bit of some you know Buddhist nationalism involved. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think Myanmar itself is you know they they don't like Muslims. They also don't like um, you know people from more like Eastern Asia. Like it's a very they're very pretty, they're very nationalistic as far as their identity. And I think Sun on Sun Tzu Xi is is a part of that. I'm in in that Atlantic article. Um, that they talked about, they talked about how like it was, you know, she had moments where it was like uh, she would look at her a picture of her dead father and be like, it's us, it's a you and me versus them, father, it's us. And like, I don't know, it, it just seems like it's a very like Myanmar, like she kind of has a nationalistic tinge, but because it was this whole, we're going to make the first democracy that the West was so willing to accept her. Um, I don't think they really, I think you were right. I think you had a correct analysis that the West didn't really do its due diligence in vetting her as far as like a leader that we should support. And we're start, we're seeing the effects. I also think that I, I like, I mean, she's obviously known to try to limit the junta, the military junta's power ineffectively. So I think she understands that the military is way too much power. I don't think she's like, I don't think she's ordering these genocide. I don't think that, but I think she's complacent because she's in this political position where she, in order to, in order to get any sort of reform in, she has to have the benefit of the military. And if she doesn't, if she starts calling out her own military, then it shuts down any of her political goals. Um, But the problem is, is that military is engaging in ethnic cleansing, which is atrocious. So yeah, she's in this terrible position where she can't, she can't really do anything um, against the military without risking her own political movement. And, and in a weird way, again, we have to remember that it's the outside world that's calling her on this. It is not, mm-hmm. it is not the people of Myanmar, unfortunately. It seems like, if anything, her, her strength as far as like, you know, Myanmar's going to handle our problems ourselves and maybe we get criticized by the, by the West might even benefit her politically. Um, as like a strong, you know, not listening out a puppet. She just she does what Myanmar wants. And again, like I said, there's a pervasive ethnic conflict issue where people within Myanmar might not certain certainly don't care enough about the Rohingya to really stand up to what's going on. It's the it's the external community that's calling her out. And it's really a shame. You know, I, I think that's a very sound point right there. There's there's a lot of truth to that is where it almost seems like she's become the West figurehead for Burmese democracy more than the actual figurehead for it. You know what I mean? Like it, it more seems like she's who we wanted to back, who we wanted like because because obviously I think both of us could agree that we want to see fair and free elections and open democracies. Of course. And I think and, and I think that got under everyone's skin in the West enough that yes, she was the figurehead of a movement, but but I like I still go back to what I said earlier is that it's hard to change a system from inside of it when the system's broken. And, exactly. And, and 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 I think you're right. Is that I mean there is a lot of you know um, kind of racism and hate amongst other people of ethnic minorities. And I mean according to the that, that Atlantic article, they have the longest running overlapping civil wars in the world, which I think could probably understand why the military has such a pull kind of looking at the other side of it, it almost does make sense why this junta has maintained power because people at the end of the day like comfort and stability. And and obviously the governments before this and after this did not bring them stability. I mean, the Japanese occupied it in a very brutal time. The British ruled it for years following. This has been a country that has seen colonization, imperialism, and ethnic division. And I think a military in some ways does bring stability to that. Um and it's true. I just don't think that the the world really did their research on her because she has a troubled past. And I think her I think her motives are probably correct. And I mean, I would argue that since, you know, 2015, 2016, the country is probably in some ways in a better direction. At least at least there are challenges to the military junta. But unfortunately, you have this Rohingya population that is getting the brunt of this. And it's and it's quite depressing to see. I 
I love the quote from the Atlantic. Um, I'm going to read it really quick if you don't mind. It's fast, but it's just it talks about how it's not Myanmar that's changed, but the world around it. And this is the quote. 20 years ago, democracy was on the march. Authoritarian China wasn't yet flexing its muscles. Neighboring India had it turned divisively to Hindu nationalism. A liberal United States was the sole underwriter of the international order. Terror was terrorism was a peripheral threat. And the Pandora's box of social media had not been opened. Hmm. So I, I, I think in some ways it's just times have changed. And, and you know, their state counselor, Shun Ki, is fighting for something that at one time could have been more possible than now. But like you mentioned, we have seen a surge of nationalism, Buddhist nationalism, you know, neighboring Hindu nationalism with Modi. And unfortunately, I almost think the time for an open democracy in some of these religiously divided countries could be impossible. Yeah, well, and again, this the the military control over constitutional amendments, and they all the military has the sole control to claim, um, you know, a national emergency, right? So there's a lot of these like almost fail stops to progress. That like, mm -hmm. yeah, you can get close, Myanmar. Yeah, you can get a, a democratically elected leader, and you might get a little reforms here and there. But if things if the things change too much, there's fail stops. Boom, dead in the water, and um. I think it's going to, I don't know what it would take to kind of get rid of those roadblocks. Um, um, I mean, perhaps, perhaps it, it might be something like the global community reacting to this genocide, right? With, with, you know, heavy sanctions or I don't know. I mean, like, but I think that this, the fact that she wants to create a, a functioning democracy, but then also allow a military to go about ethnic cleansing. Like you just can't have, you can't do both. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's impossible to convince people that you yeah. live in a free society when it, people are being ethnically cleansed. And so, um, it might, I think it's going to have to maybe take response from the global community to say, Hey, you know, you, you can't do anything in Myanmar until this Rohingya thing is figured out that that would actually limit some of the power the military has but again i don't i don't see that happening especially now when you do have this um you know pandemic crisis I, this i have i have to imagine something like this is going to put on the back burner for a lot of people um unfortunately right unfortunately and it you know it's going to affect thousands right no and i mean i I think that's what I got out of that Atlantic excerpt I read was that it's almost like I mean because you you talk about it and I agree with it you know a national recognition there needs or not sorry international recognition but I almost think that that's not going to happen like as that quote said the U.S. doesn't care right now China's now obviously not caring as we talked about the Uyghur situation right um, and the world is in a pandemic like it, it just seems like the time for Myanmar to have su substantial reform is almost past for the time being and I know that's dark and you know lacks optimism but I just don't know if there's much that can be done right now because there's just no focus on it and and obviously you have from Modi to Xi Jinping to even Trump and Bo Bolsonaro in Brazil these guys don't seem to care no. um and so it's it's going to be really complicated, I think, to actually enact change. And that's why part of me does give Xu Qi at least a little little support, because at least you're seeing – I mean, this is something that probably did not happen 20 years ago, where at least you have a majority of the, of the parliament supporting limiting the military. And I think those are steps. Those are the small things that eventually over time I think need to be – addressed and i think that's why at the end of the day i think her intentions are right just maybe the actions and the way she's gone about it are not and i think you you hit it between the eyes when you talked about this this nationalism this buddhist nationalism because there is probably part of her i mean her father was one of was a key leader prior to the military junta's rule in myanmar and you have to know that there is a bit of uh you know politicization even on her side and so it's it, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting, uh, and like like another interesting thing that I was that I was reading about is that there is one country that uh, does well with this, and it's a country that we've talked about a couple times. We did an episode on it, and they have built a large deep seaport on the coast of the Rakhine State. Um, can you guess what country is building a giant <laughs> seaport on the? <laughs> if I had to guess, it would be China. Wow, bingo. Bingo. <laughs> Belt, and, Belt, Belt and Road Jeopardy. And and yeah, I mean, that is the freaking problem is that apparently 
the, why these aggressive attacks have been expedited is because the military wants you know, calmness in the region so that China can keep building this giant project. And so China's moving in because obviously, as we've talked about, they don't care about their Muslim minority population. And so obviously their business is fine for China in Myanmar. And that probably makes the military junta even more want to control this Muslim minority, which is scary, dark, and I don't see there being an easy solution. Certainly not. It's certainly not. It's a it's a pretty depressing reality to see what's going on in Myanmar. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, it seems like, it seems like this happens every now and then. I mean, this is like another Darfur, you know, we're in that, we're in that territory of deaths now, you know, we're talking over 25, 30,000 deaths estimated. I mean, again, you know, they've blocked, they've blocked journalists from going into parts of that state Two two Reuters journalists were in a, in Myanmar jails for a year before being let go because of their coverage of the of the genocide. Um, it, it's really depressing, and it's sad that it's sad that you bring up that other part of how China wants to you know help build a port, and Myanmar just kind of wants to get rid of the undesirables for their economic expansion. It is just <laughs> it's just a sad reminder of um, what, what unfortunately what humans are capable of. Um, when we just blind ourselves to human rights and we, we get wrapped up in these identities. Um, again, you know, this is a 90% Buddhist nation and the Muslim minority is about 4%. Who's going to defend mm-hmm. that? Who's going to defend that 4%? It seems like nobody. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's why. I, I remember in political science back at Chapman, back in the OG days, I remember we talked about how for a functioning democracy, the government and the civilian population needs to have a monopoly monopoly on on force and security um and it seems that maybe that's the missing step in myanmar is that the civilian population and the people elected government does not have a monopoly on force and security right. so like you said this three to four percent muslim minority does not feel protected because the government's pro- not not protecting the people you have a buddhist nationalist military junta who has been in power since the 60s and and I think that's the issue is that a democracy needs to have civilian over overrule of of the military, and that's something that's missing there, which means they're not going to protect every citizen. No, they're not going to protect them, and, and they're the ones ena- enacting the uh, the destruction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, nah, there's there's institutional pro- flaws that allow for this to happen, and Aung San Suu Kyi is at the center of it all. And it's again back to that that kind of through line. It's just crazy to see how someone who's had a Nobel Peace Prize and was hailed by the West as a a uh, a, a glowing figure of democracy is now for the rest of her legacy. I think going to be tied with a genocide. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's it's, it's quite remarkable, you know, because I I do remember reading about her back in I think I think it was twenty sixteen, and it was a promising figure, you know democratic leader of Myanmar, hoping to end military junta control. And unfortunately, actually, the deaths have surpassed those prior. So it it, it is too bad. And I, I think it just shows that a lot of issues that we like to just put a label on are much more complicated than we think, you know? Sure. Well, and I, I also think that perhaps maybe like kind of this is a kind of a side side note but maybe the 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 west as a thing or like the the democ- d- democracies in the west need to be more careful about just like promoting people as such that maybe aren't i remember when muhammad bin salman was the young new saudi arabian prince right and he did something he was like oh i'll let women drive and i and i and people were like he's the progressive new young leader in a saudi arabia Progressive, my ass, dude. That guy, okay, that guy is not, is still the same kind of Saudi royal you expect. He just let women drive. Big whoop, you know. I think, yeah. I think, I think. Off this happens so time and time again that we see a little glimmer of hope and we say this could be the driving change in the whole region. And no, it, it turns out it's a lot more complex and people are entrenched in ethnic identities. And so it just, I don't know. It sort of reminded me of the whole MBS situation of. The media, when he first came around, was so quick to promote him as this changing figure. Uh, and now, again, you know, it, it, in reality, it's not. Yeah, I mean, I 
I think Western leaders like the shiny things, just like the Western <laughs> public does. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, sure. Hey, MBS is progressive. He's young and women can drive. He also killed a journalist in Turkey and locks exactly. up his own family. Right. Um, and, and it's kind of that one step forwards, three steps backwards type of idea where yeah. we, we like something new that gives us hope. But I think we try to cement our Western view of what is right. Mm-hmm. On, on places that are much more complicated that we still don't truly understand. And, and that's the issue is that, you know, uh, one person's good person is another person's enemy. It's just really hard to just put a blanket name like, oh, she's good for Myanmar because she's pro-democracy. Right. Well, she hasn't condemned a genocide. And MBS, yes, he's given women rights and he's opened theaters and he's, you know, westernized the country. But he's also doing the exact same BS that his, his other family members have done. And so it's like... Yeah, if it shines, but not all glitter is gold, you know? Not all glitters is gold, man. The old Led Zeppelin got it right. Not all glitters is gold. <laughs> um, I think you made an excellent point, though, is about our framework of how we sometimes put uh, foreign politicians into the idea of a Western framework, and we expect them to act accordingly. And we, and time and time again, we're shocked when they don't. Um, yeah, I think we need to stop doing that. I think we need to stop, like putting putting people into a framework that fits our own little western bubble of like ooh she's going to be like ooh she's she's pro democracy she must be like bernie sanders like anything but anything but <laughs> yeah no it's no it's completely true it's completely true and you know and, and that's why i am not one of the ones that's going to call her just uh you know someone in the passenger seat of a genocide cuz i think it's more complicated than that and it goes back to the idea like you said we we sometimes just like to put a name on something we don't understand. And, you know, if she's like, if she's done anything at least semi positive, I'll give her the credit there where she's created a discussion, international at least, that this junta is impeding democracy. And I, and I think there is something at least semi optimistic to know that at least someone finally has the political clout to at least try. And, and I know it's not a lot, but it's something. It's something, but I've also seen her like def- like she's been called out about the genocide, and she's downplaying it. She's also downplayed it, where she said mm-hmm. things like, "Oh, some soldiers may have gotten out of hand when they were asking for papers," and you know, it's. But I would not call it a genocide. That's way too harsh of a description. And she, like, she's flat out like it's n- it's not like it's gone out of her control, and she doesn't have the reins on it anymore. I mean, it, it is some of that. I, okay, like, sure, it is some of that. But she has done, she has made the choice to downplay and defend the military instead of do do things to, to call them out. So, again, like, yes, she's in a politically complex position. I understand that. And this military junta has been doing this for decades. But she's certainly, I think she certainly is in the passenger seat on this one. Hmm. No, I mean, it's... It's true, and I think I think we're gonna see we're gonna we're gonna kind of see what happens because I mean we have to remember that this was 2016, 2017. I mean practically because of all the chaos in the world, this hasn't been talked about very often, right? You know, and this only came to light to me a couple like I guess last week when I was just reading about this this parliamentary blockage of passing reform, right? And they and they still want to be called a disciplined democracy, and it's and it's true. I mean this is an issue I think that's gone under the table, and it's still happening. And, and the problem is again. This issue has seeped over into neighboring countries, and it's probably just going to cause more resentment, more hate, and more destabilization. So I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just. Unfortunately, it's probably. I, I, I think I say this too often, but a lot of the issues we cover, it seems to be, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Yep, I think that's. I think that's accurate. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's accurate. Any other thoughts before we end this uh, this episode <laughs> of the Tonic Accord podcast? Well, I have a lot of thoughts, but uh, we'll save those for another rainy day. Uh, No, I think that's about it for now. (laughs) Well, with that, folks, um, thank you again for listening in. Again, this is one of those topics that, you know, we obviously are all concerned about the COVID pandemic, but it is good to be reminded of some of the other issues that have been going around across the world um, to always make sure you're staying informed um, from a multitude of sources and uh, and look at the nuance and things. Um, this is certainly a tragic uh, but very complex situation in Myanmar that we just wanted to kind of cover and talk about uh, and keep you informed on. Um, if you have any concerns, questions, or thoughts, please let us know in the various places, YouTube, Podbean, Facebook, Instagram. 
And even if, I mean, we're all sitting at home anyway. Send me a pigeon with a note on it about what you think. <laughs> um, we'll take anything. So thank you again, guys, for listening. And, uh, and thank you, Alex, for, uh, you know, the great time we have co-hosting this together. Yeah, thanks, Drew. It's been fun. And I mean, like I've said before, I, I, I enjoy this, this format because I think both of us learn and we've improved articulating things. Maybe we didn't even know we, we believed years ago, you know, so it's fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Um, have a good week and uh, keep washing those hands.